I think I admitted him. There he is. Is that Matt? Is that Ryan? It says to me here to continue, so I'll click that. Hmm. My 19-year-old gave me a year of tech support as my Christmas present. But oh my God, he needs, here. can he, does he giving out those gifts? <laughs> you could get a gift card from him. I admired the cheapness of the gift. I said, good, you saved yourself a lot of money and I need that. I need but the It has a lot of intrinsic value. <laughs> I could Hi, lady. Hi, how, how are you? This is Matt. This is great. Hi, Matt. Doing good. All right. Um, so um, I could, uh, Let's see. We'll just do a quick sound check. So I think we're going to have to turn down your mic again, uh, lady. Um, I think there's something on the back I was looking at this morning. Is this better? Is this better? Oh, uh, yep. Go ahead. Count back from five for me. Five, four, three, two, one. Yeah, oh, yeah. That sounds good there. Ooh, look. Right, we thanks. followed the problem. Three weeks trying to get that problem fixed. <laughs> I just turned a button. <laughs> yeah, it's just the gain on the mic that needed to be turned down. Okay, cool. All right. Mark, go ahead and do me a favor. Count back from five. Five, four, three, two, one zero all right sounds good um i'm gonna have you turn up your mic just a little bit uh, mark um go down to the bottom left corner of the zoom window and uh click on the little arrow next to the mute button okay all right and then click on audio settings Right, and then in the middle of the window there, you'll see a tab that says automatically adjust microphone volume. Make sure that's not selected. All right, did you click that? Oh no, uh, Mark, you click the mute button. So in the bottom left corner, you see the little microphone. There's a, that's the mute button, but right next to it is a little up arrow. You gotta click right on the arrow. Okay, I unmuted myself, and I'm, my options are leave computer audio, test speaker and microphone, Mac Air speakers, uh, select the speaker, same as system, MacBook Air, MacBook Air microphone, select the microphone. Oh, audio settings, maybe that will... Audio settings. Yep, that's right. Audio settings, click that. Okay, I did. All right, and then um, in this window that came up, the middle section is your input, that's your microphone. Um, there's a little tab that says automatically adjust microphone volume, make sure that's not selected. Oh, unselect that. Okay. All right, and then I'll just above it. there, below where it says I'll test mic, it. Is a uh, this is the volume slide bar? You see the little blue slide bar there. What uh, what would you say percentage wise it's at right now? Uh, 60 percent. Okay, let's move it up to about maybe 70 75. And then and then do me a favor and count back from five one more time. You want to unselect this? Okay, I want to. Okay. Love that tech support you're getting. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Five, four, three, two, one, zero. Okay. Yeah, that sounds good there. Awesome. All right. Thank you. Close that window now. All right. So we are good to go. If you're ready, I'll get you started. Yeah, let's go. All right. Have a good show. Thanks, Matt. Welcome to Habits for Happiness with Lady Fuller. The path to happiness is paved with healthy habits. We spend much of our lives searching for happiness when the key we're looking for is right there inside of us. We can discover that key through habit change, which you're about to learn about. Now, here is your host, Lady Fuller. Welcome to Habits for Happiness, the show where we discuss habits you can employ to, in your daily life to make you happier. Here on Habits for Happiness today to talk about the habit of caring is pediatrician and author, Dr. Mark Vonnegut. Welcome, Mark. Thank you so much for being here. 
Thank you for having me. Of course. Well, let me just introduce you because you are an impressive human being, Mark Vonnegut, who is a change maker in his own right. Mark is a pediatrician and author and will talk to us today again about caring. He will discuss his new book, The Heart of Caring, A Life in Pediatrics. And Mark is the son of Kurt Vonnegut, who Mark wrote The Eden Express, a memoir detailing his struggle with psychosis and manic depression. Mark gained acceptance to Harvard Medical School, from which he graduated in 1979 and has been practicing pediatrics in his hometown of Milton, Massachusetts ever since. And we were joking before the we got on the show that if you're from Milton, Massachusetts, you've probably seen Mark. <laughs> He's a doctor who's seen many people in that town. Um, but his book is phenomenal and really moved me. And I want you to just tell us a little bit about, you, you know, your latest work, um, The Heart of Caring, why you wrote it and the message that you hope um, readers get from it. So I'll let you let you take it away. <laughs> I want people to know uh, what a joy it's been to devote my uh, life to taking care of the same community. So I've seen, I see children of children I took care of and I can walk down the street. I remember one kid um, who I looked at him and I kind of knew him and he put his arms out and flexed. Uh, <laughs> and, he, and, he, and he said, Dr. Vonnegut, I got big. And I said, yeah. <laughs> it happens. <laughs> Six, four, solid muscle. Um, yeah. So I, you know, I've coached soccer. I, you know, it's, it is, it has been fun for me to be a doctor and I fear uh, for the next. I don't hear you. <laughs> oh, you're on mute right now. Okay. You were saying that you coach soccer and. And uh, it's just, it's, it's been, for me, it's been a joy and fun uh, to be a primary care doctor. Uh, and I don't think the next generation uh, is going to have that joy. I think they have uh, people other than um, medically trained people telling them what to do. And, um, and I don't think they'll get to see the same patients over and over. And mm -hmm. that's what makes us good diagnosticians. I think time is the best, um, uh, it's the best diagnostic tool we have. Um, and it, it's, it's uh, been, it's, it's been great. And I see now there are good doctors in emergency rooms and urgent care uh, centers, but they don't get to see the same patients over and over, which has been a huge part of what I've been able to do. Yeah. And so, you know, I've, I've read and heard in interviews you describe and others describe your book as sort of a love letter to your patients in that way. And that's why you're sort of describing as this sort of transactional relationship that isn't just about, you know, a doctor reading off a diagnosis off of an iPad, but having sort of this, um, this relationship with patients that allow them to stop you in the street and show you the muscles and everybody laugh. <laughs> It goes beyond um, the 15 minute window that they might be sitting with you. So, so why did you choose the word caring? So that, um, what, you know, and what does that mean to you as part of in the medical field and beyond? I think caring means making a connection with patients and without caring on either side. Um, I don't think healing and true care can happen. Um, mm -hmm. So when I boiled it all down, um, it's actually my wife says, you've got to tell some of these stories, but what's let me um, uh, be a good doctor is patients caring for me uh, and, and making connections in uh, my reciprocating their care uh, and connections. Yeah. So connection sort of the heart of it, which is for all of us, like a primal need. Right. And which brings me sort of to this idea of, you know, we've just endured two years of COVID um, where we've had a lot of loss of connection, right. We've had what's I would term isolation 
And, um, you know, how have you seen that impact your patients? I know you don't see adults, you see children, but, um, how do you think that's impacted the medical field and, or our psyches maybe also? I think it's, it's impacted children as much or Mm. more, uh, than their parents. There's a true epidemic having trouble with behavioral problems uh, for other reasons before COVID-19, but now um, I have an epidemic of depression and anxiety. Mm. um, And uh, it's just, it has, I think it's made social media worse because uh, it's such an impersonal way of relating to people. And I think it's made all kinds of relationships much harder and these kids are suffering. Yeah. And so you do see these things that we as adults experience, right? For our listeners, they might be experiencing, but we sort of don't really know the effects on kids. So maybe you could tell us a little bit more about what you see and sort of more the, the, um, the community of children that you see. Um, because we, as adults, we sort of just assume that children are resilient or they don't feel isolated or whatever it is. They are. And one of the things I can lay out for children Uh, And I often actually say, uh, you know, you can change. Your parents, of course, are hopeless. They're not. (laughs) (laughs) Old dog new tricks, right? I I, I point things out like, um, you know, if you walk two miles a day, it's going to have a better effect on you uh, than your parents. If we get to the point of using medication, which I never thought was going to happen. Mm -hmm. Um, you will respond quicker to your parents. If you eat well, it will make more of a difference to you. If you get a job, you know, and so I can go on and on and point out the resilience that children have um, and, um, and, and lay that out for them. And I think it's, it, it makes them feel positive. I, I, you know, babies come into the world, these little, and they are connection machines. They're scanning around for eyes, they're scanning for faces, they're scanning. And so I do think uh, we're herd animals, we're social mammals, uh, and we need the connection um, we can, with others. You, you can't have a baby just do well on their own. Yeah. You know, there's that study I'm sure you're familiar with. It was like a Russian, Russian orphanage in maybe the 1950s where they left the children alone in their cribs for, you know, something like 20 hours a day or something. And the socio-emotional problems they had as adults were, you know, far and wide. Mm -hmm. Um, So, you know, I love this idea that we are come into the world as connection machines. I just want to repeat that for listeners, because I think that's beautiful that our desire to connect is very primal, right? I mean, if you were, a caveman and you were thrown out of your tribe, it was a, you know, a pretty certain death. So Mm -hmm. our need to be social and our need to connect with others, um, you know, in person is really important to our livelihood as well as our survival, right? Our our critter brains telling us (laughs) that we have to, right? And so tell us more about, you know, I think one of the things that really struck me about the book is sort of like the de-evolution of, um, the healthcare system, which you describe, you know, we talk about sort of how doctors can be more caring. So like, just for listeners, like, you know, if they're feeling like they want more of a connective experience with doctors or for their children, right. What should they be looking for? And which leads me to my next question, which we can discuss in a little bit, like, what can we do in the medical community to improve this connection? In an ideal world, which I think, um, can exist, uh, the doctor has to be able to will to be willing to walk into a room and say, uh, how can I help you? How can I be of service is what they're really asking. Mm-hmm. And for the patient, if they can just give the simple answer uh, to that question, and then it becomes a dialogue. And I know I've done my job when at the end of a visit, um, the parent or the patient says, Thank you. So it's really basic politeness. <laughs> if you mm-hmm. come into yeah. a room with a stranger and 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 you don't pull out uh, a computer or whatever, you just say, "How may I help you?" And the patient says, "I'm worried about an ear infection, or my kid's not doing so well in school," uh, and um, and you just you just respond to that, and it's it's common human manners. 
Yeah, I love that. And you had described this idea of like, you know, medicine used to be that you walk into a room with sort of what exactly you're saying, no assumptions, right? Sort of like you're an open mind versus having diagnosed the patient and or put them into a category before you've even walked into the room. Right. Yeah, and and you don't know what you're going to walk into, and you walk into this beautiful, healthy baby, and you look over and you see uh, a, a woman who is really, really struggling, and you say, "Your baby's fine, but you need some help with your depression." Yeah. and I have some social workers that can help you get that help, um, and so I really have an opportunity to. Uh, change in uh, the parental experience. So one of my favorite patients came in to me with her new baby and she said, am I the worst mother in the world? <laughs> We've all felt like that. I'm a mother too. I mean, I feel like that maybe on a daily basis, but yes. <laughs> and I, I say, no, we have a list of the worst mothers in the world and you're not. <laughs> um, but then um, you know, years later, and this woman now has five kids and she's tough as nails. Um, but we have just sort of this, we can look at each other and we <laughs> now oh i saw your eyes blink that's a good sign but i still can't hear you uh, let me click my volume but i think we were having some internet issues but so you were talking about this idea there, there we go i don't know what was happening with the internet so so you had a woman who came in now she has five children and and she's she's now tough as nails but when we see each other there is uh, you know the relationship of being able to tell somebody that they're not even close to the worst mother <laughs> in the world and uh, yeah so you're influencing the whole family system right Um, but I, it's, um, you know, I can't, it's also teaching the parents how to do that, how to communicate. Yeah, totally. So, you know, I was thinking, you know, you're influencing as a pediatrician, the whole family system, not just the child, right? Mm -hmm. You're influencing everyone. And when I go to the pediatrician with my children, they turn to me and ask me, you know, do you put a seatbelt on your kids? Do you, you know, do they wear helmets when they ride bikes? And so it is, you know, the sort of conversation and I always appreciate at least our, my pediatrician here in Aspen, Colorado, that she does sit with me for a little bit afterwards. And she never seems like to be in a rush. And that's something I really appreciate is yeah. her just wanting to chat. Um, because I know from a business perspective, the doctors are definitely given, you know, X amount of patients to see. I know some people that see, I think I have a friend who's a doctor who sees something like 30 patients a day. Um, in these 15 minute intervals, which just seems incredibly like a lot to me. But, um, you know, my pediatrician, for example, doesn't need to, to run off. Yeah. So, it, so zooming out a little bit, right? So we have this idea of like finding a doctor that is connecting with you and um, you're taking that extra care, but sort of like the medical community at large, right? Like what can we do to, <laughs> to have an evolution of caring? The medical Doctors and nurses want to be good at what they do. I've spoken to uh, you know, medical groups about somewhat about uh, behavioral issues and depression in themselves and stuff. And at the end of one talk, there was a hand in the back and I said, yes. Uh, and this woman just said slowly and carefully, when do we get to help patients? Mm. So there was this 
uh, lack of, and there's this belief now that you have to uh, do your asthma plan, you have to do this, you have to do that. Uh, and that's really why I took the risk to uh, start my own practice. I did, you know, I, I don't like people telling me what to do. And I don't think it's good. Me neither. <laughs> <laughs> and I, years ago, I discovered, and I think it helps a lot, is I don't wear a watch. Mm, I love that. Tell me more. <laughs> and I don't talk, I don't put my hands on the door and continue talking to people. My hands stay in front of me. Uh, I personally do not, and I had for a while, all my other providers um, not have computers in the room because in certain studies, 40% uh, of a doctor's alleged eye to eye time is spent on a computer. The wow. average, average doctor interrupts the average patient 10 to 15 seconds into their story. So somebody can say, oh, I'm worried about an ear infection because, and the doctor will say, well, is there any coughing? Is there any vomiting or diarrhea? Because they have this feeling they have to get through this, uh, you know, they have to do whatever it is, six patients an hour or whatever. Somebody is else other than someone who went to medical school, someone is telling them how many patients they have to see in an hour and how they have to code and bill. And none of that had anything to do with what people used to learn in medical school. Right, and it sounds to me like this is the art of listening, right? Yes. Because of these finite times right. that you know doctors, while they want to help patients and they want to listen, they don't have the time Mm -hmm. um, to be able to listen. And, and I think what I hear you saying is that like listening and caring live in the same bucket, right? They live in the same bucket. And even technically, uh, 90% of the diagnosis, uh, comes from the doctor being quiet and letting the patient tell their story. One of the things I say in the book is, um, the best thing you can do is shut up and let the patient be the important person in the room. Unfortunately, there is no diagnosis code or way to bill for shutting up. Yeah, no, totally. I think that that part actually makes me laugh so hard and did make me laugh so hard. I love that. And I think this is also true in like all relationships, don't you think? Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I do think in uh, the medical relationship and in friendship, and, and all these things, uh, you know, it is about connection. And if you have, in medical care, if you have no connection, you have no healing. And, it, and if they have no healing, if you don't have uh, something that helps the patient, then you have no connection. So I think connection and healing are intimately um, the, and, and there's no way around it. You can't, you, you know, I guess if a patient's in a coma or whatever, but um, most of the time, the, the, the important thing is connection. Yeah. And, you know, I think like this idea too, that, that the, that the person coming in, the patient usually has the information, they have the yeah. answer, right? Yeah. It's not necessarily the diagnosis from the doctor. It's really the information that they have, which is the power mm -hmm. um, in, in creating a, diagnosis and a treatment plan that will work for them. So, so just backing up a little bit, do you think this is an American problem or do you think this is around the world, a global problem? I mean, do you think, you know, because we're sort of independent people by nature here in the U S that we have, you know, a harder time with this type of caring? We do. And it didn't mm -hmm. used to be this way. And that's why I talk about when I started practicing medicine, I had a, leeway, a lot of freedom. And that freedom, I think, let me be a better di diagnostician. It's not all around the world. Um, in, you know, doctors elsewhere are not under the same pressure as doctors are here. One of the things that we're under pressure of is debt. Um, a student comes out of uh, residency, a half million dollars in debt. So among their choices of uh, what specialty 
uh, they're going to do is the calculation. How do I pay off my student debt? What wow. it costs in most of Europe to become a doctor is a very simple number. It's zero because mm -hmm. those communities believe that a well-trained doctor is an asset that will help them and that medical care is an asset. We look at medical care as an expense and we forget to uh, calculate and look at the cost of not caring. Um, and that's, you know, poorly controlled diabetics and so forth. There is a huge cost to not providing medicine. Yeah, no, totally. I mean, this is, you know, obviously this huge issue it has been for the past, you know, sort of 10, 20 years in America, this sort of hot topic, but also just this idea that we used to be more caring and somehow in our fast paced debt ridden world, what I hear you saying, we've lost sight of that because we've been worried about dollars and cents, but we've also been worried about our time and we're all moving too fast for our own goods, in my opinion. <laughs> and therefore it's, it stopped us from listening yeah. to our patients and our doctors and each other. Right. When I started practicing, 90% of my time was devoted to straight patient care. Um, my, the, uh, the overhead for my visit ran about $3 a visit. Uh, we had three doctors who shared one full-time employee. There were no deductibles. There were no um, co-payments. Uh, and the, what it cost to see a doctor back then, because he was not in debt and because his overhead was so low, it cost to see me was, it was 10, 15 and $20. Mm. I don't think I could do it for that again, but I could do it. I could do it for uh, 20, 30 and 50. So what's, what's the solution, right? So if this is a problem that's rampant around us as Americans in our sort of medical industry, what, what are solutions? I think you can go back to the very, very simple idea of do no harm. And we do not allow, uh, medicines that don't work, medical devices that don't work, uh, doctors who hurt people. Uh, we do not allow those things to be part of medical care. And if we looked at and got rid of the procedural and the medical delivery things, uh, which were more harmful than good, uh, we would save uh, patients uh, billions, maybe a trillion dollars. We are spending uh, twice as much as anybody else. We are putting out uh, $4 trillion for second-rate medical care. That's a lot of money. And I think a lot of it can be saved if you get rid of co-payments, get rid of prior authorizations. These are things that are proven to do no good. In fact, to do a great deal of harm. And if we went that way at medical care, I think you can see it's not red or blue. It's not, it's, it's just plain straight math. Yeah. I mean, it's like arithmetic. It's not even, yeah. it's not even calculus, right? It's very <laughs> no, basic. Algebra. <laughs> it's in between. Arithmetic. <laughs> right. And so, you know, I, one of the things we're going to go to break, but I wanted to discuss when we come back is to stay on this um, topic of do no harm, which leads us into talking about the drug industry and their influence on doctors and how they treat patients and the level of care that's able to be given. And I was very excited to learn this week, and I'm sure you know about this, that Mark Cuban's opening a pharmacy of generic drugs um, and how that will shape up the shake up the industry. And I'm so excited to learn more and see how that rolls out um, and to hear your thoughts on, on him. But before we hear it, so everybody hang on, we're going to head to break. Um, and then we have Dr. Mark Vonnegut on today for Habits for Happiness, talking about the heart of caring, his new book, and the power of the habit of caring um, in the medical practice and beyond. So hold tight, everybody. All right, great job. We're all clear. Thanks. Back in a couple minutes. Thanks. Thank you, Mark. Sorry about the internet connection. I'm not sure what happened. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's um, you know, I'm glad we have Zoom because at least it's, it's better than nothing. <laughs> <laughs> but, but sometimes 
it's uh, I, I mean, imagine trying to conduct a relationship on Zoom. And I remember one question I saw in the newspaper was, uh, you know, is it okay to break up by email? And I said, no. <laughs> I guess it's better than Zoom. I don't know. <laughs> Take your pick. <laughs> They're both equally bad. <laughs> or there are these words I've learned like ghosting someone where you yes. just don't respond at all. Ever hear from them again. But you'd right. only be able to ghost someone in a digital age. I right. guess you could ghost someone in the older, like you, they could just disappear, but they would have to physically move. Right. right? <laughs> <laughs> or I guess never call you back. You know, it's very interesting how technology it makes us less connected, actually. Um, then connected. And one of the things that's interesting is I'm a coach, um, a life coach, and I work with clients on the phone right now because of COVID. And I actually work with them mainly on the phone and not on Zoom because I find that, well, Zoom's wonderful. We have internet problems or people tend to look at themselves the whole time. <laughs> and uh, one of the things I found with uh, strange uh, parents and children uh, is if they actually talk on a real so they can hear each other's voice the other thing that works is having kids or, or parents uh, write a letter because mm. then as information that somebody's thought about and written and they see a handwritten you know and so then they know uh, their father their mother their son their daughter uh is, is something about the effort that that we put into communication, which which is again, it's, it's healing. It is healing. I love the phone. I mean, first of all, I love a handwritten letter. I'm a big thank you note person. I love letters, but I also think there's something about the phone where you can sort of we have to listen harder, right? Mm -hmm. um, and you can hear someone's intonations more mm -hmm. so. And I also like it, you know. And you had talked a little bit about. Um, and you had talked about it in the book, but walking, right? This idea of it's prescriptive. And I asked my clients to walk. I'm like, just walk and talk to me because you actually reveal so much more, your body's in motion, you're, you're not distracted. Um, you know, one of the things that I do as a coach, which is funny, that really resonated for me, sort of as you talked in your book, is this idea that you can prescribe these habits for people that they're not doing like walking or eating better or <laughs> instead of ADHD drugs, you know, and like, you can say, you're not allowed to tell me that it doesn't work unless you try it. Yeah. And I remember one patient who just wouldn't do anything. I took a $20 bill. I put it in a jar and I say, if you can do one of the four things I've told you to do, I will give you that $20 bill. It's your $20 bill, but you have to either walk, clean up your diet, stop smoking marijuana, stop swearing at your mother and, or, you know, and, and, and so, you, and I think the real message to the kid isn't the $20 but it is that I care enough to put the 20 in the jar. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry yeah. to jump in, but we are coming back. Okay, thanks. You are listening to Habits for Happiness. To reach the show today, call in to 1-888-346-9141. That's 1-888-346-9141. Now, back to our program. Here again is Lady Fuller. Hi, everyone. Thanks for hanging in there. Welcome back to Habits for Happiness, where we talk about a habit each week that you can employ in your daily life to make you happier. And today we have Dr. Mark Vonnegut to talk about his latest book, um, The Heart of Caring, but also about his sort of, you know, 40 year career as a pediatrician, um, mental health, and all these other things that go into the beautiful power of caring in our lives and beyond. So Mark, welcome back. And I, we, before the break, we had talked about this idea of, of the medical community and doctors sort of making this pledge to do no harm and therefore to be better doctors and provide more of a caring relationship. So that brings me of course, to, you know, our over prescription or over, <laughs> or, uh, sort of our over, uh, sort of ability, or I would say, or 
you know, the ability or desire for doctors to medicate before really diving into some of the habits that I prescribe my clients like walking and <laughs> meditating and reading and, you know, calming their nervous system through all these different habits. Maybe it's changing their eating um, and why doctors are so fast to, you know, prescribe medicine. So can you tell us a little bit about that and sort of how that's impacted the medical industry? I think it's the fastest way to get out of a relationship. And that's the most terrible thing to say, but somebody comes in, I'm worried my child has an ear infection. And so there's a huge motivation because the doctor has to see six patients an hour to put an otoscope in there, say, yes, your child has an ear infection. Uh, here's your amoxicillin. And so that whole relationship takes all of two or three minutes. Uh, when I see them in follow-up, I look in the ear and I said, there's no way on the planet earth that this cat child had an ear infection because it's not even a little bit thick. Uh, and I say, and even if your child did have an ear infection, you can treat most in ear infections with nothing. You can't come out of an emergency room with a, you know, without a, a prescription. And a lot of those are unnecessary. And I, because I've been in the same community a long time, can explain to people that they don't need that medicine. But it certainly takes a lot less time, especially in an emergency room setting, uh, to diagnose things that aren't there and treat things that aren't there. Yeah. And what's the cost of treating things that aren't there to us as human beings? I think it's huge because it's not just the money, it's the attitude um, that of going to a doctor and this is what you're going to come away with, uh, uh, you know, a prescription. And the fact that uh, insurance covers it somehow makes it all right. And I, and I have explained to people and said, well, this is an expensive medicine, da, 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 da. And uh, they'll look at me and say, don't worry, doc, I have good insurance. So the insurance that they have encourages them really to, again, look at the medication as the answer. It's not, yeah. you know, for, for pneumo I, you know, pneumonia is easy. If somebody comes in with pneumonia, that doesn't take a long time because yeah. easy to diagnose. I know what to do. And parents don't argue with me the way they do about immunizations or other things. Right. Um, they take their medicine and the pneumonia gets better. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, you know, I was, I was talking before the break that Mark Cuban is um, spearheading this effort to open a pharmacy with affordable medicines for all. Mm -hmm. So tell me your thoughts on that and, and how you think the reception will be in the medical community. I think uh, it's a wonderful thing for patients. And when you're looking at the equation for value to patients, which is what we're supposed to do, the denominator on the other uh, side is money. And mm -hmm. so if it's uh, insulin or generics or whatever, anything you can do so that patient, it costs patients less increases the value. Um, I think the medical community should, um, you know, embrace this and 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 love the idea that they're able to uh, help patients for less money. But I'm very naive, and I'm often surprised, especially politically, about how crazy this country is. <laughs> I remember, I, I, and it was I'm laughing long, with you long before COVID. And I remember, you know, people talking about gay marriage, and my attitude was. Who's going to care about that? Yeah. <laughs> it, it turns out a lot of people care about it. And it still seems ridiculous to me for most people to care about someone else's uh, you yeah, know, love life. Yeah. Or whatever. yeah. So uh, I will, you know, there may be some blowback uh, for, you know, people who are making money. And unfortunately, money rather than mission is now driving a lot of what gets done. Uh, somebody will find a way to complain about Mark Cuban and call it socialist or whatever. <laughs> but, but it could I, be <laughs> that we're, anything, we're reaching the art of caring again. Anything right. that makes medical care less expensive. 
the only good thing about COVID-19 that a lot of people didn't mention, uh, notice, is that for acute care for COVID-19, the insurance industry said there will be no co-payments or deductibles. This improved public health. It made medicine much quicker. Uh, it made it much more efficient. It put doctors and nurses in charge of what happened. It saved uh, families and patients hundreds of millions of dollars. So that's just a very, very simple thing that was done in reaction to uh, a disease. Uh, we got rid of co-payments and deductibles and improved care. I love that. So pivoting a little bit to talk about you personally. So um, in your memoir, you had talked about sort of your um, diagnosis of bipolar disorder, which is multi-generational in your family and um, its effect on your life. Um, and you're a survivor and a bright light in the universe. So thank you for sharing that. And I think one of the things that people might want to know is, you know, did caring um, affect you positively throughout your mental health and sort of your relationship beyond that? And we can talk about sort of more caring and mental health after you answer this question. Absolutely. Uh, caring was integral. I mean, and now if you are <laughs> unlucky enough to have a serious, severe mental illness problem, uh, you will spend several days in an emergency room, never talking to a psychiatrist. You will finally get into a hospital whose goal is to get you home within two weeks. Um, and you will probably be over-medicated to prevent relapses. Uh, my first hospitalization uh, was, you know, and this, this was years ago, uh, 50 or so. <laughs> Can't believe I'm that old, but... Um, You're uh, young. <laughs> that it, it, the, uh, it, you know, it took four months. It was a four month and the, the doctors and nurses were very, very careful. There was a lot of teaching that went on that doesn't go on now. Uh, the price tag, and I was horrified at the time that this cost my parents uh, $11,000. And I don't think you can stay half a day in a hospital today for $11,000. Maybe yeah. you can spend a few days. Yeah. But you're also not going to get the caring. Um, yeah. I noticed the last time that I got more care and, um, and, and helping from the Haitian, um, you know, night staff and, uh, Haitians, Haitian, without Haitians, our, our health system would collapse. But anyway, I can speak because I've been in Haiti, I could speak a little Creole. And so these night persons would stay up. I could talk about my back pain and this, and I, they'd talk about this and I'll say, bon guy, which means good time. Good, but I got more human contact from my, uh, you know, Haitian night staff than I got from the psychiatrist. Yeah. And so that level of caring, you know, was healing for you. Absolutely. And I think it always is. And the caring, um, that helped me in my first hospitalization was the doctors and the nurses and the psychologists, I remember, but it was also my parents. Um, mm -hmm. And it was also, especially my mother, who had experience with bipolar disease. And so I could, she could actually talk to me about the voices and the delusions and 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 it was, you know, I knew I wasn't the only person. Uh, who had heard voices and stuff. Yeah. And for those people who might be listening, who struggle with bipolar disorder, you know, what type of care should they be looking for? What advice do you have for them? They should get good and compassionate care early. Uh, mm -hmm. And there should be um, a better realization without, within the medical community, how serious these illnesses are. Uh, I think bipolar disease is 20% uh, lethal uh, because of poor choices, accidents, uh, and suicide. So these are not trivial illnesses and they should be willing to provide the caring above and beyond the you know, sort of two week limitation on hospitalization 
uh, they should care more. Yeah. And so they should care more, but talk us about a society as a whole, you know, mental health has been a really hot topic since COVID has been around, but I've a suicide prevention advocate myself. It's been a hot topic for my whole life. So tell us more about how we can be more caring as a community to those people who might be suffering from a mental illness. I think we are. I yeah. think there is much less stigma mm-hmm. uh, than there was uh, when I was sick 50 years ago. There was much more acceptance of, of the role of medication. There was much more um, therapy. There were many more therapists. Um, so there was, uh, I, I think we as people, as a society have done and are doing a better job um, you know, with serious mental health problems, the, the people who, who still, and I've always said they're the biggest problems are doctors <laughs> who are tied up in stigma and they're terrified that somebody will find out they've been depressed or anxious or on a psych med. That's changing a little bit too. But I think the public is way ahead of doctors. Wow. Yeah. I know. I mean, in my research around um, suicide, you know, doctors are on the very short list of sort of high professions for, you know, um, the danger of suicide. So Mm -hmm. that is interesting, right? That the doctors and even, you know, from some of the research that I did, doctors at the institution also sort of hide, um, hide the suicides that might be happening or the mental health problems that might be happening within the institution as to protect reputation or whatever. Yeah. So tell me, go ahead. I just said, I've made a very conscious effort for myself and for my patients tonight to not hide the fact that I've had mental illness. And most patients, they have their own concerns. And I remember one patient who came in and said, Dr. Vonnegut, I didn't know you had mental illness. And I said, yeah. He said, well, you know, my son John is having a lot of trouble or whatever. So she could care less. I mean, she could care uh, about my mental illness, but her real concern was with her children. So there was not a big deal. The fact that her pediatrician uh, had had mental. Yeah. And I guess leads me to my next question, which is how has your mental health um, struggles in the past made you a better doctor? It's made me a better diagnostician. Um, you know, I can, you know, I can see a bipolar disease, uh, you know, 10 miles away. I can, you know, I recognize these things and I'm able to, and I think it's a huge part of, uh, you know, of the human condition um, is, is mental illness or uh, versions of it. There, there are people who are bipolar who, never go to a hospital, never need any med- medication and do fine. Um, but, and I think it's made me um, just sort of more knowledgeable and more empathetic with those problems. Yeah, I love that. I mean, it, made, it makes you more trustworthy, right? Because you've walked the walk and talked the talk and lived it, right? And been the survivor that you are. That's beautiful. So one of the things that is you know, comes up for me as we talk is just the, obviously in the heart of caring and is just like, how can we start to speak in this sort of like caring as cultural currency in America? Because if we don't have it as much as other countries have it, obviously that would, you know, matriculate down into the healthcare system if we put that as a high priority just on our human beingness, so to speak. Um, how do we do that? How do we, you know, how do we be more caring in our daily lives? Just I as humans come to, I mean, just the, the simple truth is medical care is supposed to be for patients. Uh, patients and their needs should be put first. Um, and doctors were trained to be advocates for patients. And if they're acting as advocates for patients, they don't get burned out and they don't feel oppressed by some middle management person telling them their, uh, their coding is wrong or their met performance, you know, there's so much nonsense. And if you took some of the nonsense out of there, then once again, uh, medical care would be um, 
caring about patients and um, yeah, and, and and their needs being the greatest rather than the checklist. Yeah. And so I guess one of my questions, even zooming out a little bit more is like, how would our lives as sort of Americans be different if our sort of collective currency was our ability to care for one another? I think we would feel uh, safer and that our needs would be met. And if your child broke an arm playing football, uh, that would be taken care of. Uh, there would be a community hospital, which by the way, we've lost 40% of. Um, wow. That was a proud part of that community. And you would be seen and your arm would be in a cast within an hour or two, which happened to me. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah, I was a hero. The the cheerleaders, uh, you know. I think in in middle school, there's nothing greater than to have to play football and have cheerleaders. Uh, say, <laughs> yeah, my son plays football. He's twelve. So yes, yeah. I know. So then my next question is, you know, you know where we align um, specifically is, you know, I tell my clients a lot of times. Um, if you, the first question they always come to me is, you know, I have anxiety. That's a, something that's very common amongst my, my clients. And one of the first questions I ask them after they I've listened is, you know, how much water are you drinking and how much sleep are you having? And it's these sort of basic needs that a lot of us aren't getting right. You know, I think I read a study that something like we're getting 30% sl less sleep than we were in 1900. Right. And we actually have a lot more going on, or we think we have a lot more going on and we need more sleep to be able to, to deal with all of that. So what are the things that you tell patients are sort of not <laughs> prescriptions that they can do to improve their lives? I think anybody over the age of 10 should know how to scramble eggs and take care <laughs> of themselves when they're hungry. <laughs> I love this. This is great parenting <laughs> advice for everyone that's listening. <laughs> and when, And to have the idea of taking care of something or somebody else. Um, a lot of depressed teenagers are just sitting there with this utterly flat affect and you go through, you care about money. You say, no, I've got plenty of money. And I said, that's too bad. <laughs> <laughs> and when I get down to the bottom of the list, I, you know, the two things that I get positive results with, I say, uh, do your parents bug you too much? Is your mother on your case too much? And they'll say, yes. And I say, well, part of the deal here is I'm going to tell your mother to stop bugging you. And that will hook them in. And I say, when all else fails, how do you feel about puppies? And, you know, everybody wants a puppy. And I've had people come back 10 years later saying, thank you for making us get, I said, I didn't make you do anything. I gave you an option uh, of, of getting and taking care, uh, of, of another mammal. So now uh, their moms aren't nagging them. They're nagging you because they had to go buy a puppy. Oh, and I, then, I, then I get in arguments in front of the child <laughs> where, where about, you know, well, I don't bug him or whatever, but I'll say, well, you know, let's just take it at face, face value. And can you make an effort to not bug him so much? And mother say, yeah. And, yes. I say, the puppy, and they'll say, no, no, no way. And I said, if he stops swearing at you, if he does his homework, uh, if he cleans up his room, um, if he spends less time on video games, I'll, you know, give them a list. I said, if he was able to do that for six months, would that make your getting him a puppy more likely? And there's no mother who won't say yes. Yeah. And so what does caring for others, including puppies, do for our happiness? There is something about service as social mammals uh, and whether it's um, volunteering um, at a homeless shelter or whatever. Uh, and that makes connections with other people. And that makes both sides of the connection happier. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, it's this idea. So, like if you don't know how to help yourself, help somebody right, else. Right. Right. So if you know how to scramble eggs, <laughs> scramble eggs and puppies, guys, I hope that's what everyone's taking away from this, this hour with the brilliant Dr. Mark Vonnegut. And Mark, if people want to find your book, where can they buy it? Um, at, <laughs> I have to say the evil uh, Amazon. <laughs> 
<laughs> but a fact, Joe. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And I, um, and, uh, and that at the moment is, I think it's pre ordering because the official, um, they just sent me a bunch of, 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 of books. Um, February 1st is the official date at which it should be in bookstores. Um, and I now, thanks to uh, my son and my wife, I have a website. Um, what is it? www.markvonnegut.com. Uh, <laughs> But anyway, um, yes. So yeah, search up Mark Vonnegut. You can Dr. find his website. They can, <laughs> they can do that, or they can um, they can they can just, as I say, write me a letter. I answer all my mail. Oh, writing a letter. This beautiful art of letter writing, which, if you follow me, you know I am a huge subscriber to. So it's been such an amazing conversation talking about your latest book, which was out February 8th, if I heard you correctly, um, The Heart of Caring. February 1st, right? So so next Wednesday or next Tuesday. Yeah. So um, we have your book out in just a couple of days. So exciting. And um, so look for it in a bookstore near you or on amazon.com. Check out Mark Vonnegut on his website, markvonnegut.com. Um, and we're so excited. Do you have another books in the works? <laughs> no, I'm, I think I'm done for now. <laughs> <laughs> Done for now, but thank you so much for sharing your light and this, this beautiful habit of caring and how, you know, caring for others, puppies and ourselves um, can make us happier um, and how the medical community can be more caring. I love all of it. And thanks for joining us and tune in next week, you guys, for another powerful habit that can change your life um, here on Habits for Happiness. And we can continue the conversation on at Habits for Happiness, my Facebook group and tune in next week. See you then. Bye, everyone. All right. Nicely done. All clear. Thank you so much. And thank you so much, Mark. I'll send you a transcript um, of the interview and, and a video and audio version. So thank you so much for being here. I appreciate you sharing yourself with me and our audience. Well, thank you for having me. Okay. Well, we'll talk to you soon. I'm going to send you a letter. Okay. <laughs> Have a beautiful day. Okay. Bye. You too. Yeah. Bye.